Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Moon. The Garage Gym Athlete Podcast is a result of my desire to build better humans, unequivocal coaches, and autonomous athletes. I've spent the last several years obsessing over program design, nutrition, and every other way you can optimize human performance. This podcast distills the latest scientific research with what I've learned and blends it with the not-so-scientific field of mental toughness. We are here to build you into a dangerously effective athlete. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find out more about our training at garagegymathlete.com. And if you want to pursue more into the field of coaching and programming, head to endof3fitness.com. Thanks for listening. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Jared Moon here with Ashley Hicks. What's up, Ashley? Hey, how's it going? Good. We have Joe Courtney. Joe, how are you doing? Individual introductions this week. Yeah. We always like do. Well, sometimes. Last so. week was just like, hey, everyone. Hey. <laughs> well, and then we have VD. VD, how, how are you doing? <laughs> Good morning. Yeah, it's like really early morning for him, just so everyone's aware. It's always early yeah. morning for me. It's in the future. I know, but no one, I don't think we've ever actually, anyone knows that, you know. Wait, you don't oh, really, yeah. You don't normally tell zones. people when you're recording a podcast. Does, does that Keep make me, I just, am I like ruining, is it like Santa Claus telling a kid that Santa Claus doesn't exist? Is that what I'm doing <laughs> right now on the podcasting? Hopefully world? they're not listening to this in the car with their kid, but you know. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Well, we have explicit on all of our episodes by default <laughs> somehow. Most of like 95% of them are not explicit, but unless you get me really heated, I'll let something slip occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's get into updates. Uh, Joe. Not a lot going on. Just started a week or a month two in this cycle. Still eating super clean. Training's going good, but I do want to cue some very sad piano music right now. I had a lacrosse game on Saturday and I lost my chest strap from my Garmin and I'm pretty mad about it. How does that happen? You didn't f- feel it come off and you just kept playing? Or no, I, I had it on. And even after the game, I like took my jersey off and I had took the chest strap off and I set it on my bag or in my bag. I thought it was in my bag. And then I got home the next day. I was like, okay, I'm going to do some zone two. Crap, where the hell did that go? And I searched my bag. I searched my car, my house, and I couldn't find it. Are they expensive? So, it's like a hundred bucks. Dang. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not, I'm not happy about it. I, you need to get on that Apple watch. No, what? Saying. Why? No. Because <laughs> I think the the heart rate monitor I bought was like thirty five bucks, and yeah, can, but then I have to have like a six hundred dollar Apple Watch. Three hundred. So I can go, I, I can still go through like five more chest straps and still be okay with my Garmin. Oh yeah, well, not everyone gets a Garmin for free. Just saying, your watch is like <laughs> a seven hundred dollar watch or whatever it is, like six. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your update. That's it. You're sad about your chest strap. Got it. Sad about my chest strap. Yeah. And you're eating clean. Super clean. Keep us updated on the eating clean. Yeah, I'm getting all, I'm like almost like an upside down pyramid, getting all my carbs early in the day and my dinner is just straight meat and a little bit of, and some vegetables. But all my sweet potato and three carb is like breakfast. You're keto later in the day. It's cool. Actually, what you got? So last week my update was about my garage door being fixed, but I still needed a rower. Alas, people, my birthday is tomorrow. AKA my birthday is today for VD. That's really weird. Hey, happy birthday. <laughs> oh, you don't Thank get two you. birthdays. Uh, yes, I can. <laughs> I get two birthdays. At this moment she does. <laughs> um, so my husband bought me a concept two rower for my birthday. So the joke was on our team Slack chat that I got Pelotoned and quite literally except- her husband bought her a piece of exercise equipment for conditioning. <laughs> Just so everyone's so aware. Now. And I'm pumped about it. There I'm, you go. I may have squealed and jumped in no. front of my babysitter, and she probably thinks I'm a little crazy. So <laughs> I bet Scott listened to the Peloton episode, and he's like, you know mm-hmm. what? Concept 2 would be a perfect idea for a gift. <laughs> yeah. But you know, the cherry on top is not just that. He then bought me a kitchen appliance, and my second birthday gift was an Instant Pot because I'm meal prepping, which is mm-hmm. great. And I'm loving yeah. it. And I'm not upset. Look at there. So that's uh, a technique only right there. That's not the, uh, <laughs> just for any, anyone out there, husbands <laughs> listening, like 
you play your cards. All right. You got to know your wife. Know yeah, you got to be wants. careful if you want to do exercise equipment and a piece of uh, kitchen uh, equipment, I guess. What are we calling that? Appliance. Appliance. Okay. Yeah. Know, know your no wife. Your yeah, exactly. Yeah. You think <laughs> oh. of it like a thesis. You need to have like three sources and three occasions of, you know, that this you are 100% sure. Yeah, that's uh, well, that's He's awesome a though. Long way. Yeah, he's come a long way. He used to get me like external hard drives for my computer back in the day. Now that's something that I would get upset about. I don't know why, but I would. <laughs> Emily and I have been very utilitarian in our gifts for a while. That's yeah. Just, yeah. I don't know. It happens. Anyway, so so people know she was talking about a rower. We literally got off the podcast and she had a rower. Like... <laughs> It was, we're recording the podcast, Within she talks seconds. about wanting a, a rower, and then she messages us the second we get off the <laughs> podcast, she's like, I got a rower. So I don't know what kind of magic <laughs> that is. You can call it your husband or whatever, but I feel like you can just kind of speak things into existence. Is there anything else you want <laughs> right now? Right? Uh, I think, <laughs> actually, I was going to say, people should do 33 burpees, because I am 33 years wiser tomorrow. No, I'm good. So, do it. I'll Warm do up. it. Thank you. All right, VD, updates from you, man. Uh, I'm doing 33 burpees later. Woohoo! Um, Perfect. Yeah, just for you. Um, updates from me, still training, still doing the same things. Um, there's possibility I come home early, so we're pretty excited about that. Nice. Um, so six months before we thought, so my garage gym may be coming back sooner than, than expected. And do you know where you're going, and are you okay to share it? <laughs> uh i'm not okay to share it because uh i don't want to jinx it you know how uh, it is it's not official till it's official and then even then you can get a waiver and they change it so uh as soon as i know for sure i'll let you guys know but yes i i do have an idea awesome it is not far away i'll tell you that good <laughs> all right updates for me i don't have a lot Let's see we we had some challengers or some acceptors of the uh, Fat Breather t-shirt. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. We had some good submissions, so we are reviewing those, and we will. if anyone else wants to take a stab at it, go for it. Uh, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else in that category. Nope. It got the, I've been doing the sauna a lot. I'm actually curious to see what it's going to do to my power bill. Um, <laughs> that, that's the only thing I haven't factored in yet because it hasn't actually been running for a full cycle of my power bill. So I'm, I'll, I'll keep you guys updated on that because it's like, you know, there's the cost of the, the barrel sauna, but then it's like, oh, and it increases your power bill by 200 bucks a month. That would, uh, that would suck. But we'll, we'll see. I'll let you guys know. Do you have to start it like an hour before you want to get in? Uh, depends on how hot you want it. Um, I, you can get in it like 20 to 30 minutes and it'll be about 160 to 170 at 20 to 30 minutes, which is perfect for sauna temperature and then it takes about 45 50 minutes to get to 200 205 so Whew. if you're in texas can you just go outside <laughs> in the summer <laughs> uh well that would make it heat up a lot faster but no you can't get to 160 170 or 200 in texas believe it or not mm. I don't believe <laughs> it. you can well in wichita just, falls it gets up to like 115 maybe oh uh, you just have but, like put up a tent and seal off the tent in the sun and then you just or wear one of those trash bag sauna suits or have a garage like it's always <laughs> much much hotter in the garage than it is outside like the garage is normally like 10 degrees hotter than the outdoor temperature if your garage has been shut and not venting can I mean, you and emily fit in the sauna comfortably yeah it's a four-person sauna it's nice. yeah all right i'm spending the night <laughs> yeah yeah hey Anybody want to stop by, just let me know. You get your, get your time in the sauna. All right, that's, that's it for updates. Uh, join the book club if you want the book club. Been doing AMAs, so garagedomathlete.com slash AMA if you want to submit a question. Killing Comfort book, coming out later this year. Go to killingcomfort.com. I can't wait to publish that thing. It's almost like a, really? Come on, let's just, can we, let's get it over with. If that makes sense. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Let's get into the study. So the study this week is neuromuscular adaptations to combined strength and endurance training, order and time of day, and effects of morning versus evening combined strength and endurance training on physical performance, muscle hypertrophy, and serum 
hormone concentrations. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce the last name of the author Just of the study. Just say Kuzma. Kuzma. Why not? And this person was the author of both studies that we're covering. So big picture, what are we talking about? We're talking about just time of day. Is there a best time of day to train and, and what effects do the different times of day have? And we'll take a look at those things. Um, let me go big picture kind of why and what they did. Uh, so they had a morning and evening group uh, in each. So each the morning group would have group one and group two. Evening group would be group three and group four or another group one and group two, if you will. And within each of these groups, they would do strength before endurance in one group. And then in the other group, they do endurance before strength in their training. Now, this is really important for concurrent training because that's what we do. We do concurrent training. I'm reading these things, these kind of studies on concurrent training. That's essentially what this would be kind of labeled as. I know it's time of day, but this is heavily into the concurrent training world. So what matters more? Strength before endurance or endurance before strength? They had the different groups. Uh, they had 72 people start the study, 52 completed. They were late 20s to uh, 30s. Uh, the actual data they gave was 32 years old plus or minus 5.6 years so going up from 32 and down from 32 in that direction uh, no they eliminated uh, extreme chronotypes so if you're like one of those outliers who's like a morning person who doesn't need like any sleep or uh, you know your night owl whatever they they uh, eliminated any of those and the big kicker is if I read it correctly that no serious training for the last 12 months I believe um, mm -hmm. so the people, I don't know if that means they were once trained and they stopped and then they picked it back up or it's just sedentary people who haven't been doing anything for a year decided to do this. I'm not a huge fan of them doing that. I see why they do it because I'm sure if they were to take any one of us and put them in the study, the, the results would probably be like insignificant or not significant enough to report. You know, if you had us train in the morning, you train at night because we're so well trained. So I think that's why they do that in a lot of these studies. Well, I think they actually said that they were physically active. Now, I don't know what the parameters, like how they defined physically active. They just said they haven't like dedicated training for a, a year or more or something like that. So, yeah, I don't know if like walking is what they. Yeah, they might not be on an actual like periodized strength program, just casual, whatever. So yeah. they've been just, yeah. exercising, not, not training. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And it was over 24 weeks, which I really like. So I like that it was over 24 week time period. That's, that's a very good amount of time for a study to run. Uh, now just actually looking at the, uh, programming. So they wanted, or what they're there, they want to find out if, uh, you know, if it was more advantageous to get stronger, um, should you train in the morning or the evening? Same with hypertrophy. Do you, are you going to gain more muscle by morning or evening training sessions? Um, and then I actually looked at their programming because I was just curious and I actually thought it was really solid, really solid programming. So for the strength programming itself, uh, they essentially worked people through uh, a base block of more circuit training, um, a bunch of supersets essentially, and then moving up to um, more compound movements. And then they moved lastly to uh, like one or at maxes. So like really going heavy. So I, for, for the person that they were training, I thought the strength programming was pretty good. And then the aerobic programming, um, they did steady state uh, and one interval session per week for the first 12 weeks. And then the next 12 weeks, they did two steady states and three intervals. And it was said it was typically between 65 to 80% of heart rate reserve, not max heart rate. So that's uh, just something to know. Like I, I could pull up a book over here and teach you how to calculate your heart rate reserve, but it's different than your max heart rate. Um, they measured hormones, they measured strength through one rep, mag, one rep max leg press and isokinetic uh, knee extensions. And then they also did for endurance, they measured uh, a graded max cycling test. So essentially it just gets harder every set amount of time and they monitor your power, um, over that time frame. It's pretty common, uh, in the cycling world for, um, most of the time they call it like a functional threshold power test, FTP test. Uh, they, it's like. It's like a VO2 max test, like a VO2 max test. You just go until you can't, and then you get a score. And it's similar on the this bike test. So, but uh, like with a VO2 max on a treadmill, they increase the um, the grade every like 
couple minutes and that's the same with this they'd increase the resistance every i forgot the time frame maybe every couple three minutes or something like that until you could no longer go now that's a lot of information and now that, that's just me covering what the hell they did in the study because <laughs> They actually did a ton. It's two different studies. There's a lot going on. They measured, like I said, hormone levels, strength, uh, hypertrophy, endurance. There's just so much that they looked at. I really, really enjoyed this study. And the big findings, and if you guys want to chime in with more, I didn't pull, I didn't write down the exact details, but from what it seemed is that the only real super advantageous thing seemed to be hypertrophy in the evenings. Uh, so if you want muscle growth, evening training seemed to work. Uh, and then this goes in line with almost every concurrent training article, research article out there is if you want to get stronger and do concurrent training, do strength before endurance, and that'll be better for your strength. And if you want more endurance and you're going to do concurrent training, do endurance training before strength for better endurance. Sounds like counter, like, I mean, <laughs> sounds like one for one, right? Logic there. Um, but then the big takeaway I had, if you actually looked at all the percentages and everything, the difference between morning and evening, um, when there was an, an advantage, it equated to about 5%, the difference between the gains. So not the gains. The percentages were better than that. There's like 19%, 23%, all this other stuff. But the, the performance increase, let's just say that, on average was 5% difference between morning and evening. So we're going to give you guys some tips and strategies on when you should train but in the grand scheme of things, we're talking about maybe a 5% gain in your performance here. Because if you're already doing the training, whether that's morning or evening, um, and we're, let's say afternoon to evening is better, okay, we're talking about maybe 5% better. If you're competing, that matters. If you're not, it doesn't matter. 5% is not going to be enough for you to probably, you know, rearrange your entire schedule, but it's good for everyone to know. Um, I have a lot more. Well, not a lot more. I have, I have more, but I'd like to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, Ashley, what do you have? Yeah, so the biggest takeaway I took from this was just what you said, prioritize what you want to train. So when we, as for our garage gym athletes or those who are on the fence about joining with us, we have seven different tracks and a lot of people always hit us up with, you know, oh, well, these are the goals that I have. So with whatever goal that you want, just what Jared said, if you want to get stronger or if you want to work on your endurance, um, that is why we're, we obviously point you in the right direction with our tracks. And this study showed that to be positive, that if you did strength first, then you would get stronger. If you wanted to work on your endurance, um, that you would work on that first. So, and then the other takeaway that I took from this is, if, yes, if you're competing, that 5% makes a big difference. But at the end of the day, whatever time you train, whether it be morning or evening, just get after it. Um, and train when it works best for your schedule. So for me, you know, I have a little one and and I like to get mine done in the morning and I get a lot of other things that I need to get done in the afternoon. So I am a morning trainer and that's when I do it. And I, I am curious to see if I ch change to the afternoon, what that would look like. And, um, but other than that, that is my two takeaways for this study. Yeah. And just so everyone's aware, like we are a strength focused concurrent training system. Uh, just, I think that's obvious, if, especially if you follow our training and the reason we're not an endurance focused concurrent training system is because if you're really into an like in endurance in general, you probably wouldn't be with us. You know, if you're like, Hey, I'm, I'm trying to run, you know, I'm trying to do a, a full Ironman. You're probably going to get your training plan from somewhere else. You're also going to be probably training five times the amount of time that we would program for you. Uh, so we are strength focused and that's typically why you always see our strength training happen first in our programming. Uh, VD, what were your takeaways from the study? Uh, I actually had a couple. I trained in the afternoon yesterday just based on schedule and being an end of one and just having that one day of experience there, I felt the study made sense because there's one part that talks about you are probably better training in the evening uh, for hypertrophy, right? And my question about that was why? Um, because I'm always inquisitive about stuff like that. Like, why is that the case? Maybe it's, you know, you have more sunshine during the day, so more vitamin D. Maybe you've had a few meals or whatever. Um, 
so my takeaway was training in the afternoon for those on the strength and hypertrophy seemed to be better. Um, but the other side of that is why, and they don't really talk about the why uh, in this particular study. I mean, I have ideas, but they didn't really cover that. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, my in, in of one as well is if I train really early, which I did for a long time, and we're talking like 5 a.m., I, I knew my performance suffered at that time. Like I just knew it. And I don't, it wasn't as nutrition based or it was just, I, I didn't feel as strong or powerful. And I shift that training schedule to like 11 AM or later, 2 PM, something like that. And my, my performance was always a lot better. I don't know why that is. I do think that it could have to do with, um, hormones, um, which I'll, I'll get into just a, a little bit, something I think that they overlooked a little bit. Uh, but your, cause your hormones go on like roller coaster rides throughout the day. So I think that it could possibly be that, um, other than that, I don't really know, but there's a lot of, uh, papers out there that say, that say for performance late afternoon is better. Uh, but then that another point is what are you training for? Uh, because, you know, I got this tip really early on, uh, and it didn't even have to do with fitness. Uh, in ROTC in college, they, we go through our officer training school, essentially in the middle, middle of the middle of college, you know, and it's for a couple of weeks, whatever. Uh, I don't remember how long, but I had uh, the guy who was like training me for this. He was like, uh, I was like, well, you know, when should I work out? What should I do? And he's like, he's like, well, just think about what you're going to do there. He's like, you're going to be waking up at like 4 AM and working out. He's like, you should probably get accustomed to that schedule somewhat. And that just, that logic, I know it's super simple, but it's so true. Like if you're training for any sort of event, like say you're training for a Spartan race and you signed up for the 8 a.m. heat and all your training takes place at 4 or 5 p.m., you might not feel as good when you try sprinting off or dashing off at 8 a.m. So just little things like that, I think, keep in mind, like, are you training for something? If so, try to keep your training to the same time frame of which you'd be performing. Yeah, that all makes sense. Um, so hormones is, is your thought, right? Cause I was kind of going down the avenue of, you know, maybe I have more nutrients in my body. So I have more bioavailability of different things, right? So more carbs available, more glycogen flowing through the system, that kind of stuff. Well, I think so. Yeah. If you're low body fat, like you are, and you were to train early in the morning, you could dump your glycogen pretty fast and then be hitting a wall if you're going high intensity if you're going lower intensity, you should have more than enough fat to, to fuel the workout. So I guess it depends on what kind of exercise you're doing and when, but I think if you're low body fat and you feel like crap, that's most definitely a, uh, a fuel problem. Yeah. Yeah. I'm typically a morning athlete. And, and so now after, you know, eight, nine years of doing it in the morning, you know, 5 AM, 530, I, it's very difficult for me to do in the afternoon, like mentally to have the willpower to like, damn, I, I did all this work. I'm stressed out all day. Now I got to go train on top of it and go home and, and basically eat and go to bed. Like that's not, uh, that's not very cool to me. So I mean, evening sessions are like pretty much impossible for me. Like, uh, it's, like yeah. a, it's like a mental thing. Now I used to do that all the time. Like I would, cause I would train when I was in, in, uh, you know, active, I would do PT with, the unit in the morning, work all day, come home, be with a family. Once I only had one kid at the time when William would go to bed, then I would train and it was no, no issue. But now that just that same schedule, like doesn't work for me. Maybe the addition of two kids or whatever. I don't know what it is, but yeah, I don't have it in me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still active. So I got to get training when I can, but yeah, I've definitely done that schedule where you're, you're forced to do, you know, quote unquote PT, uh, and then you're like, man, that didn't do anything. So you go <laughs> right. later on and you end up doing two a days. Um, but you're strong as hell. So it works out, but yeah, definitely been there. So it makes me think though, because you and I have a, have a little competition going on, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe I do Murph in the afternoon, uh, as a self test this coming Saturday. You only got two left. <laughs> I will say both. It, I think there's a, there's a fine line. So both of my most recent PRs were in the morning, but not like super early, but in the morning. 
and fasted. So just throwing that out there. Yeah, well, mine, same. Fasted about uh, 9, 9.30 in the morning. Yeah, that's, those are, are about when my PRs have happened recently. So uh, afternoon, I don't, it, it's so de- weather dependent. I, really, I truly believe that with Murph because right now it's not super hot. Um, but it can be, the weather just kind of gets crappy in the winter in Texas. It doesn't really get that cold. It just, it's like rainy and cloudy. So like this weekend could be like a 92% humidity Murph. That's going to affect my performance, you know? And so it, it, I think those things really at this level of Murph, if you will, between the two of us, I think that weather is a, is a huge factor. I can agree with that. Joe, what do you have? So for starters, the looking at the programming for this, it came off to me as a very bodybuilder type program splits and how they yeah. were doing things. So that's kind of the lens to, to look at everyone. But when you guys are talking about the nutrition part, that was my biggest beef with this, that in no way, shape or form was that considered. And to me, there's a difference in training, especially if you're going for max effort and, and for sets like, like hypertrophy, there's a big difference in uh, fuel for fasted or not. So in order to like really accurately gauge training in the morning versus the evening, you'd have to have somebody to wake up, have a meal, get their mind right, woken up for an hour or two, and then train to better replicate the actual time of day difference to me. Um, yeah, nutrition was, was, was a huge kind of bad part about that. And I was talking to, I brought this up at PT, the, the study, and then that like motivation factor, it's, I guess if, if you're working on the evening, if you can stay motivated through the, through the day and through the evening, then I guess it'd be fine. But a lot of people and people at PT were saying that they just, in the evening, it's harder to mentally kind of push yourself. But if you're doing, I mean, not that hypertrophy is easy, but I think you don't need to be as mentally checked in to do hypertrophy as you would other things. Yeah. So the... Um, I do think nutrition is a big thing that could be left out here. Uh, and it, it could be for most people, especially people, they're not untrained. I don't know what you want to call them, but not super yeah. trained. Uh, people, it, you going back to VD's point, it could simply be a food thing. The reason they perform better later is because of food. Because, you know, we talked about the jumping back a few people who are less metabolically healthy switch from fat to sugar very early on and have high levels of lactate, these people could be in that boat if they're not, don't have a really well-trained metabolic system. If you're switching to sugar real fast, your diet is very important about what you're doing. You know, your diet's very important. So if you need more sugar, that it would make sense at the afternoon training session, people did better. So I would actually really wonder how, so this is more hypertrophy and steady state conditioning. I would wonder how this would apply to something a little bit more powerful and speed. Because to me, I feel like I would be more powerful and faster in the morning because I can be mentally dialed in. And like, if I get a good warm up in to do that versus the exhaustion of the day, the mental exhaustion, I, I don't think I would be as powerful to go and be explosive to do something versus just working out. So that yeah. I think would be something else that would be cool to test. Um, power based have, only? Or just a, a something a little bit where you have to actually f- focus mentally more. Did they? Be more mentally dialed in. I think if they did, yeah, they never maximal. They didn't do any power based stuff really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, this is actually just more of a question. So they had two training sessions per day, one strength, one cardio, and then they would flip flop them. Did they have that, like how we programmed where we were just like, you know, two blocks of this, two blocks of that, or was there actual two separate training sessions and there's a break or a gap in between? I think that the training was all done at once, but yeah, then at the same time. yeah, it was two different groups. So hmm. a group one would go in the morning, a group two would go in the evening. And, That's all that I was wondering. But then they broke it up to where, yeah, some people would do strength right before they would do the endurance, and then the other people would do the endurance right before they do the strength. Uh, and so the, the other point, you so you mentioned like things that they po- possibly left out. Like this, it's like big picture stuff, right? Like, okay, well, why, why don't you guys really dive into nutrition that much? And I had the same thing with hormones. So they, I thought it was cool that they measured hormones. I was, when I first read these, pulled up these studies, I was like, I hope that they did something with hormones. Uh, because I really wanted to know specifically, I wanted to look at their cortisol because they had increased levels of testosterone, but cortisol, there seems to be correlative data 
that when you have an increase in cortisol, you have a decrease in melatonin. And so increase in cortisol, decrease in melatonin, that means you're not going to sleep very well. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's what uh, later evening training can do and why I don't normally recommend it. Now, if we're talking about three, four, 5 PM, you're probably fine. If you're going to bed about, you know, 9 PM or later, but if you're talking about a seven, 8 PM training session, um, and, and this, this is me more talking about, you know, garage gym athletes out there listening to this and it is not super low intensity. So anything moderate to high intensity, you are going to jack up your cortisol, which will supp suppress your melatonin, which is going to affect your sleep. Is that going to matter over even a 24 week time period? Probably not like, but it will matter over a long enough timeline if you're not sleeping as well as you should. So that's just something I think to keep in mind and why I don't normally recommend evening, late evening training for anyone, because I think sleep is more important than, uh, well, sleep is just as important as your training. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. You have to do both, but that, that was my only point on, point on, uh, hormones because mm -hmm. you have a jacked up cortisol in the morning and then it starts to lower throughout the day and it should be at its lowest level right before you go to bed. So if you spike it again, that's bad news. All right. Anything else? Uh, my takeaway for the garage gym athlete is train earlier in the day if you can and do it and that's it. And I don't really care about this hypertrophy in the evening or whatever. Like I think you should train earlier in the day for a lot of the other reasons, non-scientific reasons like Joe brought up and stuff like that. I think, and, and you know, VD hit on it as well. I just feel like when you push it, you know, this is, this is stepping away from the science. I feel like when you push it towards the evening, the chances of it not happening increase. And I, fatigue. yeah, I would rather it get done. Uh, so this is me kind of stepping outside the science to give a different recommendation because like I said, off the bat, we're talking about, it's not like this. Oh, well, if you train in the evening, it's, you're going to see 70% more gains. It's like, no, may, you know, 4.3 to 5.1% difference in performance or, and we're talking about hypertrophy. If you gained half an inch around your quad, do 5% of a half an inch, that's what we're talking about in difference when we're talking about hypertrophy, you know, is that enough for you to like readjust your schedule? And, you know, you can do the math on four and a half, five percent of any performance metric and see if it's really going to be worth it for you. And if the answer is yes, cool. Maybe train a little bit later. Um, I like to train late morning, early afternoon is kind of the, the window I have. It's kind of funny. I don't have a set time. I train every day really anymore. It's always like moving all over the place. Yep. But cool. Anything else on that guys? I don't think so. Awesome. No. We can, we can talk about, um, this awesome topic Kyle suggested that we talk about. Uh, so anyway, Kyle's not here today, but he really wanted us to talk about gut health. Uh, and it actually came from Trampus in the Facebook group. He was looking for a basic overview as well as some practical tips to have a healthy gut. What experiences have you had or known of others having in the past? How did you resolve any issues? So we're going to talk about kind of gut health in a, um, tactical application type way uh, because this needs to be its own study topic in the future and we will do that but I thought that we could hit on some of the easier type stuff how to maintain a healthy gut things that we're doing and I'll talk a little bit about the why but I want you guys to go first and then I'll go last with more some of the studies I pulled and things that people should know uh, Ashley you want to go first so it's funny that we talked about this because for the month of January, I've been kind of, I kind of said this earlier in the podcast that I am taking things out and being very mindful of what I put in my body this, uh, this month. So um, some things that we do for gut health, I do take a probiotic. Um, and then I also, we also do apple cider vinegar in the mornings and I just mix it with water. I used to do lemon water. Um, lemon can help detox and apple cider vinegar. Um, we talked about fermented foods last podcast. Apple cider vinegar is fermented and um, we also drink kombucha. Um, we might not do that daily, but I mean, we add kombucha into uh, if we're having a meal and instead of having a glass of wine, we'll add it to a, a fun, fancy glass and it'll be our boot. We call it our booch, actually. 
we need some booch. Oh, I forgot to mention on the last podcast with Deep Nutrition, she specifically mentions beer as yeah, ferment, yeah. fermented food that you could have if you don't <laughs> have fermented foods in your diet. And I was like, it's a bold statement. <laughs> but anyway, that was in there. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, Someone's yeah. going to run away with that. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. This is my fermentation for He the said day. we could have beer. <laughs> he did. I well, didn't. Let's also she did. Look, <laughs> let's also look at what's in beer, wheat. Uh, anyways, um, and then things that are known as high inflammation for food, for especially for me, I've been gluten-free for almost 10 years now. Um, so we cook that way. And Scott notices a huge difference in... Um, in his gut specifically, like if he has a normal pizza versus I sometimes make pizza with cauliflower crust or something. Um, or dairy. Dairy has uh, definitely been a huge trigger point for us in our family. So we're pretty much dairy free in this house. But And then also I just be mindful of things even considered healthy. For example, I just named cauliflower. Some people... <clears throat> get super gassy or can't really process um, certain things. And cauliflower, broccoli, very starchy vegetables can sometimes also, um, I'm not saying they're bad for you. I'm just saying that sometimes that can also upset your gut. So um, yeah, that's kind of, that's a lot of things actually that we do in the Hicks household for gut health. It's a lot of good ones. All right, Joe. Cabbage. <laughs> That's eat it. a lot of cabbage. There you yeah. go. Uh, on. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, when I read a lot of these nutrition books, I f- find out the why and then I like it. And then I find out the how and the what, and then sometimes I forget the why, but I still do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, do that's kind of something I want to talk about. That's why I'm waiting to go last. Yeah. So I know what to do, but sometimes I just, when people try and ask me to explain it, I have a hard time, but with gut health, I know that Um, so with your gut bacteria, you have good and bad, and we try and eat foods that promote the good. And I eat a lot of, uh, carciferous vegetables. So cabbage, little Brussels sprouts almost every day, but only like three or four of them, just like a couple of my scrambles. And, uh, that helps promote your good gut health to pass and process all your food and stuff. And when you eat junk and stuff that it doesn't want, then your bad gut health will run rampant and cause your issues. But we, too, mix in the fermented foods and such as uh, we went over last week um, uh, with kombucha. There'll be every once in a while. This A big thing that we do when we come back from vacations is I get a, we get a big thing of sauerkraut and just go to town on sauerkraut because <laughs> we got to clean out whatever crap we had on vacation. Uh, I dabble in kimchi a little bit, but that's not all that often because it can only have a little bit of it. Dabble. Love it. Just dabble. Just a little dabble, do you? Uh, that's about it. I do not and probably will not drink apple cider vinegar. That's not the jam. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll figure out another way to get my fermentation. But that's mostly what we do. I, there's not a lot. I have a pretty iron stomach. Not a lot irritates my gut. I just notice little tiny changes. But eliminating things from Liz's diet for sure, we've had to do. And uh, yeah. VD, do you take gut health into consideration? Not at all. I eat whatever I want. There we go. Yeah. Well, well, <laughs> no. Uh, Pop tarts have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Seventeen. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, no, I I eat real food. Um, I try to eat real food as much as possible. So um, I'll have days where I only eat chicken. So it's you know eggs for breakfast, chicken for lunch, and then maybe the thighs off of that chicken for dinner. Um, and then we'll switch up, and the next day will be you know, beef. And then the next day after that will be fish. But we try to, you know, spread it around. Um, and also like, uh, I don't do a lot of gluten either, Ashley. Um, so I get most of my uh, starch from potatoes or rice. And living in Japan, both of those are highly available along with kimchi. Uh, so I get a lot of that kind of stuff. I don't, do apple cider vinegar because I think it's nasty. I don't do sauerkraut <laughs> because I think it's nasty. Um, so I choose normal dill pickles. There I love go. dill pickles. Oh, I always nice. have since I was a kid. Um, so I get my fermentation from like actually eating the pickle, but then you can drink the juice as well. And it tastes a hell of a lot better than apple cider vinegar. <laughs> uh, and it's almost kind of the same. And then uh, post-workout, you know, you have all the salt and the other stuff in there that you can replenish so it's actually a really good post-workout thing 
uh, pro tip. Uh, outside of that, man, I eat normal food. So lots of green leafy vegetables, salads, uh, broccoli is a big thing, asparagus if we can get it, uh, kale, um, I don't know, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, and Shanika is with, excuse me, really good about throwing it all in a crock pot with, you know, a pot roast or a, a whole chicken sometimes with bones and everything. And we'll just eat on that for a day or two. But yeah, I try not to eat uh, anything in a package, anything with a barcode, uh, unless I'm trying to run some diesel through the tank, Joe, then I'll, uh, I'll eat something like that. But uh, I don't necessarily have gut issues. I just choose to eat real food and not fake shit. There you go. Okay. I'm not going to say what I do because it's a secret. No, I want to, I'm kidding. I want to zoom out a little bit. Now I want to talk about the why a little bit from my understanding of gut stuff. Now I don't speak on the topic of the gut with a lot of confidence. One, it's not really my area. Like I strength conditioning, like, but the, the second reason I don't really speak with a lot of confidence in this area is because I don't think the research is super clear. I think we know that it's good. Like we know that it's kind of like Joe. It's like, we know that it's good, but we're not a hundred percent sure why, you know, like I I feel like we're really like in the grand scheme of like education and knowing things. I really feel like we're just at the beginning, like the first couple of years of the gut microbiome and like all of the impacts that it has. And I think that we're, we're really at the beginning of all of those things. And so I'm going to link to a bunch of uh, research that I've pulled and uh, have on just gut stuff in general. So my, the, the big takeaway I have is the healthier your gut, the better your immune system. And that seems to be pretty clear. You can say factually. So the better, the healthier your gut, the better your immune system. So if you have a better immune system from an athletic standpoint or from any standpoint, that's good, right? You're going to recover faster. You're going to recover in every area of life faster. You're not going to get sick as much. Um, and if you look, if you're into cancer research at all, the most promising stuff that we have on cancer right now is immunotherapy. So working with your immune system to kill cancer, not chemotherapy to just kill you. And hopefully it's only the cancer that actually dies, you know, so immunotherapy seems to be the best thing. Um, so it seems like immune, the immune system is the key in all of this. And so that's the big reason, like, my takeaway on why. Now, if you want to really dive into the gut microbiome, it gets really complex really fast. And like I said, beyond my scope, but there is, um, there's a connection between the gut and the brain, uh, because of like, I think it's the vagus nerve or something like that. And there's all like the, the, the less inflammation you have in your gut, the less inflammation you have in your body, the less information you have in your brain, all these things are just good. Um, so one of my big takeaways that, and we have it in the, uh, EO3 elements is chew your food. That's my biggest one. Like I, I'm, I don't have like an apple cider vinegar thing. I'm going to give you or whatever, whatever food you are eating, just chew it. Um, and, and I'm not saying anything bad about what Ashley Joe or VD just said. I just do all of those things too, except for the apple cider vinegar. Uh, I do all of those things too, but, uh, I just don't, um, I think that we, we can't overlook the, the chewing, like how the food's getting in there because you can eat like if you have a giant kale leaf and you swallow it, it's going to be a little bit harder for your body to process as opposed to mechanically breaking that down with your teeth. So that's a big thing that I think uh, is often overlooked is just chewing your food, just chew your food. And you know, what's really funny is like how this ties in. You guys know I'm reading the John D Rockefeller uh, biography right now called Titan. Really good book. If anybody's interested, it's like 35 hour audio book though. So <laughs> beware. Uh, anyway, his dad lived to 95. John D himself lived to 97 and they, they both were really big on this. It, it's actually like, it's in one of the chapters of the book on chewing their food and how important that was to them. They said like John D Rockefeller would almost impose like on his guests when they'd be eating, he'd be like, look, you need to chew your food more and sit and like digest this better. Worst and that's, guest. <laughs> that's like, yeah, he, he used to make people really uncomfortable and, but the dude lived to be 97 and he was super into fitness, super into, uh, his digestive health and, and things like that. So that is a definite N equals one, but I just thought it was interesting because I just passed that chapter in the book like a few days ago. And then we happen to be talking about it today. So yeah, I think chewing your food is often overlooked and something that should be, um, 
pulled up. Now I can move on to something else that is more in line with this. Um, so there is some some research on uh, taking probiotics and athletes. So that's kind of, if you want to go into the more of the athlete world and gut health, you kind of have to look at the probiotic research and it seems to be positive. So taking probiotics and you're an athlete uh, is very, is a, is a positive thing. And they think it's, like I said, due to the immune system, but there's very interesting, I, I'll probably have to post this in the show notes, show note, or post it in the show notes as well, that there's this J curve for sickness between sedentary um, recreational athletes, so most of us, and then elite athletes. So what I mean by J-curve is sedentary people, they get sick a good amount. Recreational athletes, it drops by about half. And then um, elite athletes, it doubles the rate of sedentary. Talking about just general illness. Why would elite athletes be getting that sick that much? Uh, so I'll read a little blurb. Um, it says high intensity exercise is trans transiently lowers immune function. Okay. Anybody, we could just stop there, right? High intensity exercise is going to lower your immune function. Is that good or bad? Sounds bad to me. Some of this lowering effect may be related to an intense exercise decreasing blood flow and increasing gut permeability, temporarily adding to an increased risk of infection, in hard training athletes. Okay. Uh, therefore, some of the negative effects of hard training on immune function may be a function of the intensity of the exercise effect on the gut, which is plausible, which plausibly could be reduced with probiotic supplementation. So if you are going to train hard all the time, it's going to jack up your gut, which is going to jack up your immune system. Um, so one thing that they recommend and what I just read is like, okay, if you're going to train hard and be dumb every single day of your life, then take some probiotics because you're going to be getting sick a lot because uh, it's not good for you. Um, or just don't train high intensity all the time, like every day, like we've been saying. Uh, it's, I feel like it's six weeks straight now. I've had an opportunity to say that. Just don't, don't, don't name names. <laughs> I'm not going to mention <laughs> any form or methodology of training, but it's just crazy. I don't go seek this stuff out. That's what's hilarious about it. I'm not like, you know what? How could I like, because we're going to, we have an upcoming episode of, I've already planned it out. Where does high intensity fit in? Because we do some high intensity stuff. But I want people to understand it's not evil and like how to program it, how to use it. I want people to understand that. But high intensity every day is the problem. And so much so that like every topic we talk about, I don't, I, you know, I don't have some master plan to like take down high intensity, uh, the, the idea of high intensity. We just happen to be talking about gut and I'm like pulling up all this research and they just happen to have all these studies saying, oh yeah, if you train high intensity all the time, it's going to ruin your gut, which is going to lower your immune system. You're get twice, sick twice as many times as that of a sedentary person. I'm like, yeah, I wasn't even looking for this. And it just happened to show up. So I just thought that was really interesting. Um, so that was some science for you guys. We'll link to those things. Um, and then chew your food was my only big takeaway. I just want to circle back to the probiotic thing real quick. So reading and, reading and uh, going through a lot of the, the nutrition books that I've, I've done, they've always mentioned... Uh, probiotics and picking out the right ones and probiotics do help your gut um, gut bacteria but you have so many different types of gut bacteria that I, th I think that there's there's some things out there that actually make individual probiotics for what gut bacteria you need and I've never cared enough to uh, I'm not educated enough to know what uh, probiotics I would need or want or do enough research and, and I felt like my gut was always healthy enough, but I wanted to kind of state that real quick because I think some athletes are going to take away from this. Okay. And you know, need to go get probiotics, but there's a, that's also a fancy marketing term that people stamp on stuff. Oh, with probiotics. Oh, this is this cereal has probiotics. And it's just knowing the proper ones of what you need to introduce versus just blanketing probiotics because you can also give yourself too much. And then that can also be bad. Yeah. I mean, I think I don't, I don't see any harm in supplementing with probiotics, uh, but you probably want to go with a reputable company. Like mm -hmm. I've been supplementing with probiotics for probably five plus years, not on purpose. Uh, I take athletic greens. I think we've mentioned that before. I take athletic greens almost on a daily basis. And I've done that mainly for just almost like a multivitamin because it has a lot of good vitamins in there. But the, it, this is never a reason I bought it. I actually often forget it has probiotics in it. Um, so I've been taking probiotics through athletic greens for, for several years unintentionally. So I lied. I take probiotics. <laughs> I still take athletic greens. <laughs> yeah, see, like you don't even know it's in there, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of probiotics in athletic greens. So I've been, I can't say, I mean, I have a, 
I feel like I have a great digestive system, pretty regular. It looks pretty normal. Like, let's not get into it too much further. But, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I, I never, I'm never gassy. Like, I just, I have a pretty good stomach. I don't know why, you know. And uh, the last thing, and I'll link to this article as well in the show notes, but there's um, the, the gut microbiome thing. This is, there's some interesting research of replacing, doing like a fecal transplant of they're, they're taking a lean person. Uh, so let's take BD's poop and put it in, um, an unhealthy person. And they're saying that dramatic weight loss happens after you do this transplant because of the healthy, uh, gut microbiome from BD. Uh, and then they say it also works in reverse. There's some woman in this article that said that she, she had some sort of, um, infection. And I, I don't know, they didn't go into it because it's just a mention in the article, but she had some sort of infection. She was really fit. Her daughter was not fit and they had to use the daughters, uh, as a transplanter. And so they transplanted the daughter's fecal matter into her and she gained like 34 pounds in a month, you know, and she was a fit person because they destroyed her, uh, gut microbiome. So there's a lot of interesting, like I said, this not like super concrete, a lot of interesting like stuff out there and takeaways, but it's a crazy world. Have a healthy gut. If anybody out there wants to rent my poop, let me know. <laughs> I don't know about renting. That's, that's it's, right. I think it's a, it's buying. It's a straight purchase. Yeah, rent, rent to own. Rent to own. <laughs> <laughs> we deal. put you on a payment plan. You'll be good to go. Um, but it does seem uh, the last thing I wrote down. There's a lot of there are a lot of good studies on just exercise and um, the gut microbiome. The they don't really know. Like I said, they don't 100 percent know. But they exercise has a dramatic effect on the gut microbiome and like so maybe you should exercise this is my last point that's it yeah all right anybody want to take the the workout i got it all right because i've pulled up and doing this one so we haven't done this one in a while and it makes me realize that we like we like to do these kind of medium intervals because this is like the third workout that we have that has 1k ish rowing around it because we had the Confused 5K and the River Heist. Well, Backbone has one, two, three, four, five thousand meter rows or runs with two minutes rest in between. And then after you finish your fifth thousand meter row, you also rest two minutes and then do 50 barbell thrusters, but they are fairly heavy thrusters. So competitors will do 135, uh, next 95, next 75, but you know, scale accordingly on the thrusters. So I have forgotten it's 1k and then is there you said two minutes rest and then yeah. you uh, so and so one five k, total yeah, k five was times. two minutes rest in between each 1k and Got then it. two minutes rest again before you do the barbell thrusters yeah 50 i've only done this one one time and i hate thrusters i know someone who likes thrusters <laughs> so ashley want to give any tips <laughs> Break up the thrusters. Don't do all well, 50 in a row. I don't think you can. If you're doing 50 in a row, you're not going heavy enough. <laughs> well, true, I guess. Um, and then pick your weight accordingly. So again, he gave competitors. And then for females, you know, uh, I would think, say, competitor level would be 95. Would you say correct, yeah. Jared? 95, and then, 75, 45, 55? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd probably, I'd probably stick around 65 to 95 if I was a female. Um, I'll probably stick more towards If you were a female? I meant if you're a female <laughs> listening to this. <laughs> I am one. Um, and then my other takeaway was don't blow, you know, don't go super hot out the gate um, with your first thousand meter row uh, yeah. run, whatever you do, because you've got four more and then you've got thrusters after that. So uh, especially if you're rowing, that's a lot of taxation on your legs. So Yep. And I'd go one further to say, what pace can you sustain and repeat across all five? Because that's what we do. Yeah, you hear that a lot. and repeatable. You hear that a lot in our in our briefs because I I can't even tell you how many times I've and I, we try we try but like the if I ever program an interval and then I go pull someone's interval results <laughs> and it say it was ten intervals and I look at it just out of curiosity, it's like. Say it was a, a 30 30 is a popular one we do 30 seconds mm -hmm. on 30 seconds off on the rower and so i have a lot of data just personally on on people doing those and it's normally like 170 meters 160 meters 142 meters 136 <laughs> meters i'm like you did this so wrong <laughs> so wrong um anyway so if you could do that across the the 1k but 
there is a fine line, right? There's like, okay, I want to make sure that I sustain and repeat. You can't go too slow. You could yeah. be like, wow, that was, I got the exact same time every time, but that was really easy. But then you don't want it to be so hard that you can't hit that time ever again. So it needs to be somewhere in the middle there. Yeah. That would be my challenge. Joe, you got anything? VD, you got anything? No, I think you guys hit it, you know, 90, 85, 90% on those so that you can keep it up and they get spicy. Those one K uh, intervals, we've done those a lot. And uh, I remember doing them in the test track programming last year and I got pretty good at them, but they're, they never got, I mean, they got a little bit easier, but they were still hard. It's Cause just, then they, they got easier. Trick you. Yeah. They would get easier, but then it's like, Oh, that means I can go faster. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think, I think I would choose to run this one actually, instead of row it. Uh, just simply because you got thrusters at the end, it's very similar motion to a row already. Um, so if you already smoked your hips doing all this rowing, uh, and then you got to do thrusters too, it might be easier to run it, especially mm -hmm. if you're already accustomed to running and then you just finish up with thrusters. I mean, if you really want to game it. Yeah. I'm surprised I didn't say 800 meters for running. I guess I just didn't care when I programmed that, but. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like if you're running a, a good half mile would be fine. One to one work to rest or I guess two minutes is fine too. But anyway, anyway. All right. Let's, uh, let's get out of here. Why should everyone join garage gym athlete? And Ashley. Because you have coaches that want you to do birthday burpees with them. There you go. And she can speak things into existence. That's someone I want to be around. So. <laughs> Joe. Oh boy. <laughs> You're running out of reasons, huh? <laughs> yeah. I've done this. I've done this a lot. I've been around the block. What was my first thing that I ever said? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to start saying the same thing over and over again, just so you guys know you feel free to do that. We are still working on getting some awesome new t-shirts and they just sometimes just pop up into existence uh, out of, out of thin air of genius. So VD. Uh, our coaches will let you have their poop. Ew. Oh <laughs> That's how much well, we love you. For a price. For you mentioned for a price. It. Yeah. New, very, very cheap. Very cheap price. <laughs> new poo, new you. All right. My hey, new t-shirt. <laughs> nope. Not a t-shirt. Don't write that down. Anyone. <laughs> no, no, it's not on there. Not happening. <laughs> okay. So my big thing, and I'll just keep saying it every week. If you guys want to support what we're doing and get some awesome training in the process, uh, you know, there are some, podcasts out there that do like a donation based like yay donate five dollars an episode or you know five dollars a month and or whatever uh that's not how we operate not that there's any problem with the the people who do that but we provide a service that service is programming in which we're putting our heart and soul into every single week every single month every single cycle so if you like the podcast you like the educational resources and you want some awesome training in the process, just sign up for a free trial. You can go to garageathlete.com to get that done. And we can keep doing things like these podcasts and putting out awesome programming and everything else. So that's my reason. And that's what I'll always say from now and forever because it's easy to keep saying that one over and over again. Uh, but until next week, guys, we'll catch you then. Thanks for listening to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. If you want to learn more, go to garagegymathlete.com. You can learn about our training. Let us send you a copy of our book, The Garage Gym Athlete, or you can even get featured on the Garage Gym Athlete podcast. Thanks for listening.